Hey everyone, and welcome to our video on types of biases. So in the internal validity, external validity, and biases lecture, we talked about the three main types of bias, which are selection bias, measurement bias, and confounding. So we're going to go through a few examples of each. So for selection bias, one well-known example is volunteer bias, which is when a study sample is derived from volunteers who you know, volunteered to participate. And the problem there is that patients who volunteer to participate in a study may not represent the actual study population of interest. For example, maybe people with increased health literacy, and maybe people who are more interested in the condition under study. And therefore, this study sample may not be representative of the larger um, population of interest, which is the definition of selection bias. Another well-known example is attrition bias. And this is when patients lost to follow-up differ from the general study population um, in a significant way, such as it might be people with increased medical morbidity who you know, have trouble participating in study and making it to clinic visits, maybe people with lower health literacy who are less likely to adhere to the study protocols. And this just highlights the point that selection bias can both occur on the front end in terms of recruiting study participants, but also on the back end if there's losses to follow up and those losses to follow up are different in different populations um, of patients within the study sample. The third that we're gonna talk about is the Berkson bias. And this is when patients are drawn from a hospitalized setting. Um, you know, this can lead to selection bias because patients who are hospitalized may not represent the general study population. You know, for example, if we're looking at the impact of um, aspirin on risk of MI, you know, we sample patients who are hospitalized for an MI, you know, that might not give us an accurate indication of, you know, the impact of aspirin on MI risk in the general study population of interest. Um, so those are the three main types of selection bias to really, you know, be on the lookout for. And sometimes the NBME will ask, how do we overcome this bias? And really the two main ways to overcome selection bias include um, randomizing patients and then performing an intention to treat analysis. And again, we had discussed in a previous lecture that there's two main ways to approach analyses, intention to treat, where you compare the groups as they were initially randomized, and a per protocol analysis where you compare groups based on what treatment they actually ended up getting. And as we discussed in that lecture, intention to treat analysis is better because it preserves the randomization and therefore helps to avoid um, potential selection biases. And the second is just having a very clearly defined population um, at the beginning of your study, such that, you know, the sample that you're taking from is um, representative of the actual population of interest that you're, you know, you want to study. Next, let's talk about some examples of measurement bias. So one well-known form of measurement bias is called observer bias. And this is basically when there's a systematic bias in the measurement um, of some sort of exposure outcome due to a researcher's expectations or prejudice. So one clear example of this is, you know, if you're doing a randomized clinical trial and the you know, researchers evaluating patients aren't blinded to which um, treatment application the patient was put under, they, be, they may be more likely to say that patients who are receiving the active therapy ha are having better outcomes than those who are receiving placebo, just because they have this expectation um, or this hypothesis that this treatment is beneficial and that's the whole reason they conducted the study. Um, and obviously that could lead to some bias because you know, outcomes and exposure aren't being accurately measured. A second type of measurement bias is recall bias. And this is when study participants are asked to provide you know, details from the past, but don't accurately remember the details of the events or potentially omit information. Um, and this is just a problem, especially when you're asking people to recall information from five, 10 years ago, um, such as a patient presents with a cancer and you say, oh, were you ever you know, exposed to uh, um, a nuclear power plant, you know, in childhood, you know, some people may be able to remember they took a field trip there, some may not, and that can introduce some potential bias. The third we're going to talk about is the Hawthorne effect. And this is basically that study participants may act differently when they know that they're being observed. And that's going to lead to a measurement bias because, you know, the, the patient's behavior isn't going to accurately reflect what it truly is at baseline. And therefore you get some bias in terms of the measurement of you know, their exposure and outcome. So for example, people who know that they're being observed may be more likely to adhere to, you know, healthy lifestyle choices to eat well, sleep well, um, exercise. And that may lead to some um, bias in terms of 
you know, measuring their exposures at baseline, measuring how they adhere to these lifestyle factors at baseline. Um, so for measurement bias, the two main ways to overcome it is, you know, most importantly through blinding and ideally triple blinding, which involves blinding patients, blinding researchers who are seeing the patients and kind of noting outcomes over time, and even blinding the analysts or the biostatisticians who are performing the, analyst at, the analysis at the end. The second way includes using validated measurement tools such that you know, researchers um, have good inter-observer reliability and are you know, making accurate measurements um, over time. And then for confounding, there's no, you know, I didn't want to go into too many examples of confounding because there's so many and they all really reflect, you know, as we've previously discussed, a third variable, which um, is associated both with the exposure and with the outcome, but not along the causal pathway that's explaining this potential association that's being observed. And really, I want to focus on the ways that we counteract confounding. And the three main ways include matching, which is where you have this predefined set of cases and you match them to controls who are similar across different uh, domains that could be potential confounders, such as medical morbidity, demographics, et cetera. A second way and the most commonly used way is randomization. And this just really highlights that the, the reason why we love randomization and why randomized clinical trials are like the gold standard is because in theory, when you're randomizing, you're equally distributing confounders between the two different study groups. So if you like have a thousand patients, you randomize 500 to placebo, 500 to treatment, through that randomization process, you expect that the placebo and the treatment group will be similar when it comes to demographics, underlying medical comorbidities, lifestyle habits, et cetera. Um, so by, by equally distributing confounders, you make it such that um, the chance that a confounder is explaining the potential association that you observe is much, you know, is, is very much so decreased. And the third way is um, called restriction. And that's what, it's basically a form of matching in which you only include cases and controls with a specific value in some domain that you're worried about as a potential confounder. You know, for example, if you're doing a study on, you know, the impact of uh, drinking on risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck you may just you know, restrict the analysis to non-smokers because you're worried smoking might be a potential confounder of that relationship. And by restricting everyone to, by restricting to non-smokers, you make it such that every patient in the study is a non-smoker and therefore smoking can't be having an impact on the, um, on the potential association that you're studying. So I know this is a lot of information, but um, you know, biases come up over and over again uh, both in real life and on the MBME exam. So as usual, I recommend that you um, try your hand at the associated study uh, lecture questions. Um, yeah, and just you know, try your best to really solidify these concepts. As usual, um, please like, comment, subscribe, and good luck.